Hi there, it's Kathy Cates and Melissa Hines from the Institute for Pelvic Health. And you're watching Demystifying the Pelvic Floor weekly videos providing real and simplified pelvic floor education for your real clinical situations. We've got you covered. And today we're going to go through a case of a woman who has stress urinary incontinence and rectocele. So today, Melissa and I are going to be chatting about a 66-year-old female, G3P3, who came to us um, initially for stress urinary incontinence and rectocele. She has a history of total separation of the pubis during all three pregnancies that started around 28 weeks and took until about 10 months postpartum to regain full function. Because of that, she had three C-sections. The urinary incontinence has come and gone, but it's much worse recently. It's most noticeable when she lifts her 13-month-old granddaughter. And she had one episode of total loss of bladder about three weeks ago. She's also noticed that her symptoms are worse since her breast cancer diagnosis two years ago and noticeable change with her lower estrogen levels. And she also has vaginal dryness, which she thinks is contributing to her symptoms as well. So urinary, we just kind of chatted about some nocturia at night, one to two times bowel. She was diagnosed with celiac disease in 2016 and, um, 10 years ago that was diagnosed through a colonoscopy. She was about 51. She was having abdominal pain. She has bouts of constipation and diarrhea. She takes Miralax daily or as needed. Um, mild prolapse of the rectum from the diarrhea. And she did mention that that makes her urinary symptoms worse. So more stress urinary incontinence. She does notice pulling from the buttocks area when sitting. And a lot of times when rectum is, it, fe it feels like the rectum's bearing down even when she is not actively bearing down. Um, sexual function rarely has intercourse, but denies pain menopausal for about 15 years. She's on an aromatase inhibitor as well as Celexa. And then her goals, which Kathy and I spoke about the last case study, how important the patient's goals are. And yeah. here you'll see that she wants to correct the incontinence issue and prevent any further prolapse. So her vital signs are stable. And when we really focus in on her GU exam, we note that externally, the vulva, the labia, the vestibule are quite dry throughout with mild erythema and the architecture is intact. And that's important to notice. And I think not something that we are taught to notice is, you know, do you actually see like when we're like, what does that mean? Architecture intact? Like are the labia, like, do you actually see them like starting up at 12 o'clock and running all the way down to the posterior four shut? Cause that'll, once you start to look for that stuff, you'll notice it all the time and it'll really help you as you're putting together your differentials. Mm -hmm. And then internally, um, we notice tenderness to palpation at the right pubococcygeus proximal and distal attachments. And she also has tenderness at the right obturator internus. And interestingly enough, she's got atrophy of the left pelvic floor musculature. So we wanted to chat about this case because you can have both hypertonicity, and then you can also have hypotonicity all within the same pelvic cavity. Um, so she's two out of five and she's got poor motor control of her anterior pelvic floor muscles. And then just a quick anatomy review, the proximal attachment of the pubococcygeus is on the posterior aspect of the pubic bone. And then the distal attachment is onto the coccyx. So that's how you could find well, out how to palpate. Uh, and then you, like Melissa. Kathy said, so important to assess both sides of the pelvic floor because yeah. often like this patient, one side could be hypertonic with trigger points throughout. And then the other side is just like total atrophy and very, you know, no dense muscle whatsoever. Um, and with this specific patient, she did have better contraction and motor control, like Kathy said, on that anterior um, 
it was poorer on that anterior aspect, but it was much better on the right side versus the left side. She had a very tough time finding that connection when we were working on the left side. Which is another reason why it's important to think about the symmetry of the contraction, which is something we can totally do. I think we're just, we never learned about it, but you can totally tell, like, is she contracting equally on both her right and her left side and also front to back. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have the ICD-10 codes for you. Um, and then we'll go over just a very simple plan that we created for her within the first visit. So while we assessed the motor control, we then kind of prescribed uh, a patient care plan for her. So. While we were talking through the breathing, having her inhale, getting that nice relaxation or that pelvic floor muscle drop, um, we then assessed the contraction and we assessed that on the exhale. So we said, now exhale, I want you to squeeze around my finger and try to vacuum it, vacuum it in up to your belly button. Um, she had a difficult time with this. Her like Kathy mentioned, the contraction was very minimal, hardly could feel the squeeze. We, I actually was like, uh, are you doing anything? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so she needed a lot of cues. And once we made the cue of, I want you to feel like you're squeezing my finger and lifting it up by your urethra and clitoris, that kind of was a light bulb moment for her. And she was like, oh my gosh, yeah. And I actually can feel myself getting a better contraction there and I'm squeezing less at the rectal area. So important to note if someone is overcompensating in one part of the pelvic floor and usually it's the rectal tissue because that tends to be a little bit denser um, and postpartum, you know, the anterior muscles do get a little bit more compromised. So once we gave her that verbal cue of like, and I, and I put my finger a little bit up closer to the urethra, she was getting a much better contraction. So then we educated her on some of the um, vaginal moisturizing routine to help with the urethral support. Um, and because happy pelvic, because sorry, Melissa, happy pelvic floor muscles need to be moisturized in order for her to gain strength and in order for those muscles to also be able to soften or relax, they've got to be properly hydrated. Yeah. And then we went over toileting position education to prevent any excess pressure with bowel movement, bowel elimination, um, and then just making sure that she is completely emptying urine every time she does pee to prevent some of the stress urinary incontinence. So she is coming in weekly and will do really well if she does her home exercises of these pelvic floor motor control exercises. So generally we would have her do lying on her back about 10 reps, generally three sets, um, where she is inhaling, getting that good relaxation of the pelvic floor, exhaling, getting that contraction, holding it for the entire exhale about five seconds and repeating that 10 times and doing three reps. And you can see now that we have learned about all of this, why this is such a, it's, it's gonna really help her. This patient education plan is unique to her and it's going to help her a lot more than printing out the EMR handout that says just to do kegels. Mm -hmm. and and having, yeah. Go ahead. And really individualizing it to what you are feeling. Like that's so important. If you're just saying, okay, I want you to squeeze my finger. That's not so helpful. If you're saying, I want you to squeeze my finger where you're not, where you're essentially feeling less movement or less squeeze, yeah. that's going to help the patient figure out and connect to their brain. Oh, this is what I need to be doing. Totally. And I've done this in clinic. It only, it, it adds like maybe a minute or two. That's it. You could totally do it. Awesome.
And that's a wrap. Did you like this video? If so, hit like and subscribe. Please share with your colleagues and let us know your biggest challenges with caring for your patients with stress urinary incontinence and rectocele. And subscribe to our email list at instituteforpelvichealth.com to get your free guide for tips for managing your challenging pelvic exam. And you'll get access to our weekly pelvic health content. And be sure to find us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where we post more pelvic health tips. We're also in the final stages of putting our course together. We're done with the recordings, and we look forward to sharing it with you this September. Our online course will break down the pelvic floor so that you can confidently care for your patients with pelvic floor dysfunction. By simplifying the pelvic floor and giving you practical things that you can do in your 20 then an office visit will improve patient outcomes and your provider experience. Thanks for watching and spreading the word. Now let's revolutionize pelvic health. We'll see you soon.